Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to Aerospace Nation. Now, during the Cold War, the United States had to deter a single nuclear rival, the Soviet Union. Today, our nuclear enterprise has to have the capabilities and capacity to deter a second nuclear peer, China, while also managing the nuclear threats posed by North Korea and Iran. Russia has repeatedly threatened to use nuclear weapons, and recently, in doing so, has been very effective in convincing current U.S. leadership to allow Russia a sanctuary from which it is free to attack Ukraine, negating the optimal use of U.S. weapons provided Ukraine. In other words, President Putin has deterred U.S. leadership using nuclear threats. And China is in a strategic breakout building a nuclear triad on track to achieve parity with the United States. Making this situation even more threatening to all of us is that all four of these adversaries are deepening their ties with one another with the intent to disrupt the international order. Now, given all of this, we're really pleased and happy to have with us Lieutenant General Andy Jabara here today. He's the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Air Force for Strategic Deterrence and Nuclear Integration. He's responsible for the Secretary of the Air Force for Strategic Deterrence Policy, Nuclear Oversight Priorities, Arms Control, and Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction. Uh, all of this uh, in the Air Force's job jar. So, General Jabera, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. And I think the best way to kick this off is to give you the opportunity to provide some remarks on the oversight that you have and what you're doing in your in your organization. Well, good morning. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's great to see you again. Uh, thanks as well to the Mitchell Institute. What you do is absolutely critical for our nation, just educating and, and getting that message out of the importance of our Air Force. And so thank you for that. You know, I think as we look at the, the nuclear mission space within our Air Force, I think it's helpful to kind of go back to where we've been and then where we're going. So I arrived at my first squadron out of pilot training on December 28th, 1993. And there's a reason I remember that date. I'll tell you some other time. But the reason that's significant is that was about two weeks after the first B-2 arrived at Whiteman Air Force Base. What that means is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Deterrence has never known an Air Force where our nuclear deterrent was B-2s, B-52s, Minuteman missiles, UH-1 helicopters, uh, air launch cruise missiles. And so we've done a lot of things over time. Uh, there were some uh, significant um, challenges with our nuclear mission in the 2008 timeframe, as you know, based on our focus on the war on terror. And no one's against putting the bomb on the target or protect the guy on the ground, but we, we maybe put our eyes uh, off the ball in, in a way. And so we made some changes there. And we've made a lot of improvements. As, you, as you'll recall, at the time, there was not one operational commander that was in charge of the nuclear mission for STRATCOM. And we've, we've fixed that in, in Air Force Global Strike Command, and they've done amazing things. But what the, other did, what the other thing they did at that time was they stood up with a half A-10 organization, the Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Deterrence. And, and I think that's fixed a lot of things as well. I'll talk about the future in just a second. But let me just talk a little bit about A-10. So, when we, when we made these changes about 14 years ago, there was an understanding that as big as the operational challenges were, the, the nature of nuclear weapons, they're her inherently geopolitical, they're inherently strategic in nature, and a lot of what needed to happen had to happen in DC. There's policy issues that had to happen. We had to coordinate things throughout the, the air staff. And so A-10 was created not as a emperor of nuclear within the air staff, but as a by, with, and through organization to focus the air staff on what they needed to be focused on. And, and I think by and large, there's been a lot of good that's, that's come with that. Now, as we go to the future, in that, that same Air Force that I told you about for 30 plus years, that's essentially been the same, we're now in the opening stages of our nuclear modernization uh, challenges and opportunities, where we're, we're literally changing everything within the same you know, small span of time. And so the chief and the secretary very early on realized that that is a fundamental change from what we've been doing. And as part of our great power competition reoptimization efforts, there are several lines of effort that are specific to nuclear. One of those is standing up at the three-star level, the Nuclear Systems Center, 
And so what you'll have is where you used to have a bifurcated operational command that, that was kind of split among task forces and joint force component commands, you now have an operational commander at the four-star level, you have a policy lead at the three-star level in the DCAOR, and then you have a three-star nuclear material manager uh, that will take charge of all those things that need to happen. So I'm very bullish on the on the future. Doesn't mean we don't have a lot of challenges we've got to work, but that's kind of where we stand uh, as well. Now, for A10 specifically, I see the my DCS as a I call an agile back to basics organization. Now, why back to basics? That's that's kind of a cliche, but but I I absolutely believe in it. A back to basics organization in a mission space that is so unforgiving of error, just based the nature of the weapons, you have to be focused, you have to be on your game, and we have to get the right policy to the people in the field so that they are not unnecessarily hamstrung, but at the same time have the right guidance that they, that they need. At the same time, we are going into this nuclear modernization effort across the board. And so what got us here is not necessarily what's going to get us there. And so you have to mentally adjust and be agile enough to realize things are changing. Sometimes that can be a challenge with a back to basics organization to also be agile. And so that's a big focus on, on half A10 right now. Very excited about it. I know we'll get into a lot more detail about modernization and other issues. Uh, so for now, I'll just leave it there and say thanks again for the opportunity. No, thanks very much for that, Andy. That's a very nice rundown. And I think it gets to the, it helps our audience to understand number one, kind of where we're going and exactly what your office is doing. Uh, let me kick off, if I may. I, I alluded to it in the opening remarks, but you know, back during the, 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 the Cold War, we, we dealt with one adversary, mm -hmm. uh, the Soviet Union, and the Russians or the Chinese had a, a bit of uh, uh, some nuclear weapons, but you know, now they're growing an arsenal. Then we've got the North Koreans, um, and we've got the Iranians coming on board. So could you talk a little bit about how the Air Force is adjusting to this different nuclear environment today than the one uh, the, the United States dealt with for, mm -hmm. for many, many, many years? Well, I appreciate that, because I do think this change in the security environment is the fundamental strategic challenge of our day. And it's not going away anytime soon, right? As 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 long as we're in, as I'm in uniform, uh, the the youngest lieutenant in the Air Force, the the first term airman that's coming on. By the time they retire, this will still be a, a challenge for them. Some things are common. Uh, at the end of the day, our strategic forces need to be able to deter our adversaries, and they need to be able to assure our allies. Uh, how you define that has changed over time. So it used to be that our biggest challenge was a thousand ICBMs coming over the pole at no notice from the Soviet Union. And that challenge remains and, or, through the Russia threat. And I'm not saying that we don't take that very seriously. We are prepared for anything. Uh, but it's much more nuanced as you go to different state actors. One thing that the nuclear posture review emphasizes, and the previous one emphasized as well, and our Air Force is emphasizing is how you deter an actor is often in the mind of that leadership of that actor. And that may not be the same depending on those uh, those leaders that you talked about. So how you deter North Korea may be different than how you deter China may be different than how you deter Russia. And we all have to be understanding of that and we all have to provide that. So regionally there's differences. I would also say how you assure allies might be different depending on the region as well. So we have an extended deterrence requirement in our Air Force to support the national government extended deterrence policies and, and alliances. And how you do that in NATO may be slightly different than how you do that in the Central Command region, may be slightly different how you do that in the Indo-Pacific region. And so I think that focus needs to be different. Um, now, in terms of our forces, uh, many of those forces can be common, right? We can use bombers, the inherent flexibility of bombers to go throughout the world. Uh, the inherent um, stability of the ICBM force is common throughout all those regions. Um, there, we do have support to our NATO nuclear mission as well that uh, we don't currently have in the Indo-Pacific. So there are some variances, but a lot of that is common. Critically, the, the program of record needs to be seen through to fruition to field those forces, uh, which is a big part of not just my job, but throughout the air staff uh, to, to make that happen. 
No, very good. Now, here's a, a bit of a follow on. You know, sure. all that all that expertise that existed and spent a lot of time thinking about the unthinkable, and that's how to effectively use um, <clears throat> our nuclear capabilities in, in a war fight if it was necessary over three decades. Most of them have all departed um, in the context of retiring. Maybe they're not all <laughs> departed and they're still here on Earth. I'm still fighting. Still yeah. Uh, but so how's the Air Force thinking about rebuilding its nuclear expertise? Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, um, so I'll say I'll say this. I agree with you broadly on your comment of throughout our government, throughout our society, throughout our Air Force, many people have not had to think about the nuclear mission space. So you're not wrong about that. We do have tens of thousands of airmen every day that are constantly doing this mission space. And so every American should be, and every ally and partner should be very comforted that as we speak, there are people in five states underground. There's people flying in helicopters and security forces. There's people in the air waiting to transmit messaging if required. And there's people at sea in our naval service that are keeping our way of life safe and secure. So I'm very proud of them. And I just it would be remiss if I didn't uh, talk about that. Your question really goes to the broader Air Force, right? People that don't spend every day thinking about this. I think A-10 has a large role in that, in our, in our education, in our uh, ICBM career field management function and our nuclear functions. And we are taking a lot of efforts to spread this throughout our Air Force. I was at Nellis just a few weeks ago taking a tour of the ICBM squadron of the weapons school. So this is something that in my day when I was uh, instructed at the weapons school didn't exist and, uh, and, and certainly before that. But they are providing great insights to the rest of the force, not just on their weapon system, but the nuclear environment. So, um, if, if all of a sudden a thousand ICBMs came across the North Pole, that would be horrific, but it's actually a fairly simple tactical problem set. It's, it's very understandable. The nuances that we might see with different countries and different challenges, maybe they're threatening nuclear use, or maybe they're threatening a demonstration, or maybe they're threatening a test. Uh, and what does that affect? What effect does that have? What is the what does the joint force have to do about that? And what are they constrained from doing all that? All goes into it. One of the great power competition re optimization efforts that's that we're not being led in, that we're not leading, but we are a member of is our exercises and training line of effort. How do we get after the great power competition exercises and training? And so as you go to the weapons school now and you see what they do in their uh, integration phases, you'll see more and more considerations of things like this. You can't fly in this area because it's it might be concerning for a nuclear power, or how do you do a conventional nuclear integration mission or, or the like. And so there's an education piece, there's a training piece. And then I would say there's just an understanding piece that the nuclear mission set is not just for the nuclear guys, it's for our Air Force. And, and I think as we work to that, there's growing acceptance of that and understanding throughout our force. Certainly the, the leadership in the glass doors, the secretary, the chiefs um, absolutely get it and uh, are enthusiastic supporters. Um, well, I, I th you know, thanks for the reminder, but I, because I think it, it has become so it, it is fundamental to our entire, not Air Force, as you've mentioned, but our entire nation's security structure. We do have people who it's not like they went away. We've got folks who are working this issue day in and day out, and the ongoing and the, and the bringing on of A ten too is is really significant. Absolutely, I I was at Effie Warren week before last uh, and got to tour a launch control center, launch facilities, and I'll tell you, a lot of people talk about the young generation and yeah. sometimes disparage the young generation. Uh, I, I don't see that at all. When I go through the Air Force, I think the young men and women we have joining our Air Force are every bit as good or better than I've ever seen in my career. And I just am so motivated. When you get to out of the Pentagon into the field yeah. and you see a young airman working hard, it's just very motivating. Well, I do some uh, some instruction out at the Air Force Academy. I'll just double down on that in Absolutely. the context of um, it is really reinvigorating to go out there and see the young people coming into our uh, Air and Space Force. Absolutely. Uh, because they are very motivated. Um, looking at left of launch, warning issues. Uh, back during the Cold War, um, our principal threat was, as you mentioned, those ICBMs coming over the horizon. 
Um, nowadays, there are some new technologies in, uh, that are emerging into operational capability like hypersonic weapons, um, like long range cruise missiles. So there are a variety of different means other than just the traditional long range mm -hmm. ICBM. Um, what's the Air Force doing to determine or look at and figure out attack detection? Uh, in, in some cases, even maybe perhaps before launch so that quick action be, could be taken to mm -hmm. even deter that move? Well, so uh, there's a couple facets to that. Um, in terms of intelligence collection and F2, T2, EA, to use a Air Force yeah. jargon. Um, maybe I won't get into that on this level of classification, but there's a lot of work going on in that. Um, our partners in Space Force are having huge implications for their constellations and satellites that they're putting up, and I'll, I'll let the Space Force talk about their programs. Um, one thing I do think is really important and interesting, though, with these kind of novel new systems, and I'm not trying to make light of them, we have to absolutely get after that threat, um, but our triad is designed to be able to withstand a wide variety of attacks. And I'll, I'll use an example of the ICBM. So an ICBM has been a big part of my um, calendar in the last few weeks, as you may not be surprised to, to hear. But if a hypersonic attack went against our ICBM force, uh, it would have a small impact on maybe one node. The, the, the ICBM is designed that a nuclear strike is what can take it out. It's a hardened faci underground facility. And even if you could take one out, you'd have 449 other nodes out there. And so a cruise missile strike, a hypersonic strike, uh, another conventional strike of, of some other kind, again, we get paid to, take, to get after that. And so I'm looking at that as many people are, but it doesn't fundamentally change the node of the ICBM. And that's that stabilizing factor is very important for our ICBM force. If, if you didn't have that, then it would theoretically be possible on a very small number of nodes, a couple of bomber bases, a couple of submarine bases, maybe, maybe a strategic command headquarters or something like that. You could take out the node with a small number of weapons. And so the ICBM discourages for strike because it's not possible to gain from yeah. that. Cost will always outweigh that. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. I um, uh, appreciate that. Uh, in it, up to this point, you alluded to the need for modernization, mm -hmm. um, and the U.S. is undertaking, as you spoke about, an absolute necessary modernization of our nuclear uh, triad. Could you speak a little bit in terms of the uh, about the need to keep that modernization on track for the Air Force's two legs, the, the bomber as well as the ICBM? Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. So I, I guess fundamentally when you look at the triad, is the triad valuable? Is the, is the capability you get from a survivable submarine leg, a flexible and recallable bomber leg, a messaging capability there, and the stability that you get from a large ICBM leg, is that valuable to the nation? And I think overwhelmingly, the answer is yes. This is nuclear, in my experience, Dave, is the, the most passionately argued about, and yet at the end of the day, the most bipartisan topic uh, that you can give me out there. Uh, widespread support. And it's, it's not uncommon to, to have people ask questions about the triad, but as you actually sit down with them and talk about the value it brings, almost universally, they agree that there's a value to the triad. Okay, so if you've accepted that the triad is important, which I think the vast majority of Americans and allies do, then it can't last forever without the modernization needed to happen. If you look at history, we're really in a third wave of modernization in the nuclear capability right now. We had a, a large spike in modernization in the early 60s, depth of the Cold War, Cuban Missile Crisis, that kind of thing. We moved along for about 20 years, and then there was a large spike again, kind of a, called the Reagan years, for lack of a better uh, term, uh, and then kind of moved along for a while. And then you would see, nor normally, you would see system age out kind of in the middle of the global war on terror, and we kind of missed that based on the challenges we had with the global war on terror. And so... Rightly or wrongly, the decision was made that the, the modernization has to all happen kind of at the same time because we're at the end of the lifespan for almost all of these systems uh, across the board. And so the Air Force 
uh, in conjunction with the, the department, came up with our plan where we were going to go from a four bomber fleet to a two bomber fleet of B-52s and B-21s. We're going to recapitalize the ICBM, not just the missile, but the entire complex, because the Minuteman missiles that we have today are drop-ins from an older Minuteman system that really was fielded in the early 60s. Um, the NC-3 systems that I've talked to you about before, the cruise missile that goes with the, the B-52 that really was designed with a 10-year lifespan in mind in 1980, uh, and then and then our dual-capable nuclear uh, NATO mission, which also enables our NATO allies as well, all basically have to happen at the same time. Every one of those nodes is critical to the overall deterrence strategy and, and the assurance strategy. Uh, and and we can we can talk in you know more in depth as you desire on any one of those. But I think it's helpful to what is it we want to get out of our strategic forces, and then once you've established that, then the programs of record flow from that uh, pretty easily. No, I think that last point is important uh, to reemphasize your previous comment that you made that ultimately nuclear deterrence is one of the most widely supported and by port partisan issues that uh, exist out there because people understand the importance of that. Now, to take you up on your suggestion that maybe we can dig into some of the specifics, let's talk about the B-21 okay. um, radar, uh, radar, radar uh, for a minute. It's obviously crucial um, to modernizing our air breathing uh, leg, uh, and it's fundamental to deterrence. Uh, B-21 has both a nuclear and a conventional mission. Yep, absolutely. Can you talk a bit about just how critical uh, the B-21 is to ensure that the Air Force retains a capability uh, to get inside an adversary's integrated air defenses and why that's so important, both from a nuclear and a conventional perspective? Uh, sure, absolutely. So um, the B-21 is going to give us uh, huge increases in capability in range, in payload, and in access. Uh, right now, we have a very small bomber force. And it, and it is important to remember that we are the only one of our allies that have a long-range bomber today. That wasn't always the case, but that is is the case today. And so when I joined that Air Force in late 19, you know, I commissioned in 91, got to my first squadron in late 1993, there were 10 B-52 bases, there were four B-1 bases, and we had just started the, v, the first B-2 base. Uh, today, it's a much smaller force than that. Uh, now, our Air Force recognizes those challenges, and our program of record gets us back up from 140-ish bombers to 175 with the option to go more if we think the strategic environment you know, supports that in, in our future. To the B-21 specifically and what it provides us for access, uh, I would say it's, it's really common in D.C. to talk about an inside force or an outside force, and that's not wrong. But I prefer to think of it as a spectrum of force. You, you need to be able to get your weapon system to the point at which you can deliver your weapon to the target, whether that's far away, uh, middle, inside. What, what the B-52 considers outside is far different than what the B-21, F-35, et cetera, would consider inside or outside. And so it's more nuanced than that. But we, we have to be able to get to the point where we can penetrate the adversary's IADs, uh, integrated air defense system, and we can employ weapons in a, in, a, in a way that they understand that they do not have sanctuary where they, where they need to be. And, and that has a deterrent value as well as a warfighting capability. If really at the end of the day, if, if they are convinced that the cost will outweigh the benefits and that there are no sanctuaries, that is far, more, far less likely to end in conflict than anything else. So, so the B-21 is absolute goodness in terms of low observable, uh, it's absolute goodness in the fact that we're going to shift from a largely silver bullet force of low observable bombers, where right? we have 19 or 20 of these weapon systems, uh, and then the, the vast majority of our forces fourth generation, to a part that where two thirds of our bomber force is low observable and sixth generation, and then we save the B-52 for those mission sets that don't require that kind of penetration. So I think it's a well thought out plan. Now it's about delivering that plan on time. Now, the good news is the B-21 is succeeding. It's in flight test. Uh, I always caution people to say it's early in flight test. So um, I will be happy when I see it flying into Ellsworth for the first time. I have these visions in my head of a B-21 flying over Mount Rushmore and circling to land, and I can see it happening. It's going to happen before we know it very soon. Uh, but it isn't there yet. And so we all have a lot of work to do to, to keep it on track and keep it a good news story. 
No, that's a great perspective. Um, and it is good news that the B21 B is doing as, uh, as well as it is in the context of the, the complexity of the program. Um, and when you hear representatives from both sides of the aisle compliment the Air Force on the progress of the B-21, that's, as you're well aware in our audience too, um, that's not something that happens every day. Um, there's another leg of the triad that some folks <laughs> characterize as the fourth leg of the triad, and that's nuclear command control and communications. Um, it's extraordinarily important, uh, oftentimes not thought about, but it is part of what's driven some of those costs up um, and we'll get to that here shortly with respect to recapitalization. But could you talk a bit about why uh, NC3 modernization is so important? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, I'll, I'll say this. In the American system, only the president is authorized to direct nuclear forces. Uh, and that's, that's uh, clear cut, it's in guidance, and it's been that way as long as there have been nuclear forces. So because of that, it is absolutely critical that the president has the ability to get a hold of those nuclear forces at all times, in all situations, no matter where he is, what time of day, what time of night, what type of weather, what type of threat. The president of the United States has to be able to talk to a second lieutenant in the missile field in single digit minutes in order for the system to work. Otherwise, an adversary might think in the future that it's possible to split those two apart and they might have a window of opportunity. We don't ever want an adversary to get in their head that there's an opportunity there. The costs always have to outweigh the benefits for, for deterrence to work. And so nuclear command and control is that is that linchpin. Now in our Air Force, we control about 75% of the NC3 systems that are out there. We have defined nuclear command and control systems as a weapon system. And that helps us for logistics reasons and, and the like. But really, it's probably more accurate to say it's a system of systems. It's really uh, several hundred nodes that all make up one large system. It isn't one radio that you can just mass produce and give to everybody. Because there's different ways that it has to the, the, the message has to get through, whether it's from space, whether it's terrestrial, whether it's what, what have you. Now, that system of systems is aging, just like all the weapon systems that we talked about are. And so I can point to you today and show you that there's replacement widgets for every one of those widgets out there and the status of all those programs. Are they ahead of schedule, behind schedule, on schedule, funded, et cetera? But what I'm really proud about of our Air Force is the, the progress we've made in the last few years on what I call NC3 Next. And so in conjunction with the NC3 Enterprise Center and in Omaha, Nebraska, the Joint Force, the Department, the Air Force, the Navy. Um, our Air Force is taking a leading role in getting to what is the future of NC3. So it isn't just widgets replacing widgets ad infinitum. Is there are there opportunities to really shift? I'll tell you just, to, just briefly what I mean by that. So a lot of effort being made throughout the Joint Force on uh, joint all domain command and control and different efforts there. I think there are natural differences between NC3 and, and ABMS and JADC2 and, and those variants. But there's a lot of similarities as well. Um, when I was a lieutenant, we would have a completely separate NC3 system from our conventional command and control systems. And at, at the time, we would just put a multi-billion dollar satellite up into geo orbit and then just not think about it anymore because it works pretty well and no one could get after it. That's not the world we live in today. And so we need to leverage the, the benefits we're gaining out of joint all domain command and control, figure out where the differences are. Uh, one, one example is I think there will always be a human in the loop for nuclear command and control. There's going to be a lot less automation in nuclear command and control than you might see in conventional, those kind of things. Figure out where those differences are and then plan to that. Um, but leverage all this capability that we're, we're doing right. in a revolution in communications. Um. Oh, thanks for those insights. Uh, it's a, you know, it's it's something uh, that I mentioned in the beginning that people intuitively understand is absolutely required, uh, and in part, the recapitalization is a big piece of it mm -hmm. as well. Absolutely. So, uh, thanks for that uh, insight. Now, as we wait for uh, Sentinel and the uh, B twenty one. 
uh, and other nuclear modernization pieces like the command and control piece we just discussed, um, we need to rely on, continue to rely on these aging Cold War systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what, what are your biggest concerns about continuing to do that, uh, given the age of these these systems? Sure. Um, so I would say um, I have a couple concerns. One is that we're challenged to do all these at the exact same time. So there's a budgetary concern about that. Uh, and then I would say the unknown unknowns. So as you look at all our weapon systems, and I'll use Minuteman as, a, as an example of that. So as you know, there's been some uh, discussion of the Sentinel program and the status of the program. And, and Dr. LaPlante did certify the program to continue, uh, but also rescind, rescinded their milestone B, which means we're going to go back to how do we cut costs and how do we, how do we um, keep that where it needs to be or get that to where it needs to be in some cases. What that means is Minuteman is going to have to continue. Uh, I can show you charts and budget lines and the like that gets after every one of the challenges we see in Minuteman to keep it relevant. Uh, but we can only program and plan to what we can that we what we know is going on and what we can predict is going on. And and as we go to the right, whether it be Minuteman, whether it be B fifty two, whether it be Alka missile, whether it be whatever have you, there's always the chance of an unknown unknown. And a lot of our suppliers don't provide parts for these kind of systems anymore. Uh, and so it's long lead times to try and get these systems um, logistically taken care of. I think that is one thing that one of the very first GPC efforts that the chief and the secretary came up with was this idea of a nuclear system center commanded by a three star that would get after that nuclear materiel piece that is, is in much better shape than it was maybe 15 years ago. But as we go to the next level of modernization is just going to become more and more important. And so that was a one of the very first things that they decided that we needed to do. And, and so we're, we're going to move out on that. Uh, in terms of, so that, that's maybe the ICBM. And in terms of our B-52, as you know, um, B-52 is kind of a microcosm of the greater modernization effort. We're putting engines, radar, new NC-3 radios, and a new weapon all on the airplane at the, you know, in the exact same years. Some of those programs are very technically challenging. Some of them are not. And it all has to sync at the same time while we operate our B-52s and bomber task forces throughout the world. So that's going to be very challenging to do both those at the same time. At the end of it, we will see a B-52 that I call an extreme range capability. So it already has a very long range capability at the unclassified level. I think we say 8,800 mile range. So add another 25% to that. And the advantages in the Indo-Pacific region are, are obvious. So we will have an extremely capable standoff platform in the B-52, uh, but we have to keep it sustained until we get to that point. Well, thanks for that. Now, the link between space and nuclear stability goes back all the way to the very beginning of the mm -hmm. U.S. military space program. Um, now that we have a separate service, the Space Force, um, How's the Air Force evolving its cooperation with the Space Force regarding those critical issues that um, uh, are associated with space in our nuclear enterprise? Um, yeah, thanks for that question. So I, I would say that I don't know if I'm in daily coordination with the Space Force, but I would say three to four times a week. So if it's not daily, it's near daily coordination with S10, which is part of the COO uh, office in, in the US Space Force. There's a broad understanding in our Space Force leadership of the importance of the nuclear mission. First of all, that's key to their mission set. But if you actually look at the leadership of the Space Force from the CSO on down, many of our senior leaders of our Space Force started out in the nuclear and missile business just the way our Air Force career fields were designed at the time. And so they understand it just inherently from a young age. And then they also understand kind of what we need to do to all work together and succeed. I think uh, it, as I look back at my career at the times I've interacted with first Space Command when it was an Air Force major command, uh, and then we go into the, the Space Force. When I worked at the National Security Council running the nuclear weapons portfolio, my my sweet mate that sat right next to me was the Space Force, or the at the time, uh, Space Command, but ended up founding the Space Force at the time. So we've been side by side, shoulder to shoulder for years. I think it's actually only growing stronger. 
Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So we have reinvigorated uh, what I call the Nuclear Oversight Council. So this is a se Secretary of the Air Force led, co-chaired by the two service chiefs, uh, four-star level conference that happens three times a year that's dedicated to the nuclear mission space. So this is distinct from Corona that we put focus and light on all the various nuclear things that are out there. That is the OPR for that, the uh, primary lead for that is co-chaired by Space Force and Air Force A-10. So uh, we work together very closely. Um, tomorrow, um, General Burt, the, the COO of the Air Force, and I are going in shoulder to shoulder to talk to the undersecretary on a nuclear issue. So that's, that's more common than not. Uh, and so anytime you have an organization that has um, widespread span of control, you have to focus to work together. But I think it's been very successful so far. Uh, excellent. Um, let's shift gears just a little bit. You bet. Um, and talk about the F-35, which uh, it seems to always be in the news. But it was recently certified to carry the B-61-12 nuclear bomb. Um, that is a pretty big milestone because it makes uh, the F-35 the first fifth-gen aircraft to be nuclear capable. Um, what's the significance of this certification uh, in the context of how it'll expand U.S. flexibility to meet this spectrum of nuclear threats that we talked about at the mm -hmm. beginning. Yeah, it's absolutely a big deal to us and, and actually to our allies and uh, partners especially. So as you look at the deterrence challenges we have, I broadly put them into two categories. There's, there's strategic deterrence and then there's regional deterrence, right? So we have to be able to uh, handle large threats to the homeland, and we also have to assure our allies in regional areas. And so the F-35 is, is foundational to that. Fr frankly, the F-35 by itself is foundational to that. But when you marry it up with the nuclear mission is kind of what you and I are here to talk about uh, today. So the F-35 certification that uh, uh, General Gunny Schmidt uh, did a few months ago, combined with the B-61 Mod 12, will give us the fifth gen capabilities that you're so familiar with in sensor fusion and the like, along with a very accurate uh, um, life extended B61 weapon that has a tail kit. So you can have a more accurate weapon, which means you can have a smaller yield and still achieve the same effects, which is, I think everyone would like to see uh, that as well. And then it provides that capability to our our allies that do our NATO nuclear mission space. As you know, NATO defines itself as a nuclear alliance, and that is done through that dual capable mission. And so having our NATO partners that are flying the same fifth gen capability and have that is very critical. Now, the other piece I would say about F-35 is I would call it first out of the shoot in modernization, right? So we, it's often that people think about bombers, they think about submarines, they think about ICBMs, but that that regional deterrence capability through the F-35 is actually the first one that was fielded and isn't PowerPoint is actually in, in the field. And so that was very important for us to show that that's basically a good news story and, and is deterring. So we're very excited about it. Okay, I do want to make sure that we leave some time for questions from our uh, audience, but one, so one more from me and then we'll, we'll switch over to our audience. Okay. So get ready for that. Um, over the course of the war in Ukraine, uh, Putin's made a serious uh, uh, a series of irresponsible nuclear threats. Um, just this past May, Russia conducted exercises involving simulated use of their smaller yield nuclear forces. Um, how concerning to you is Russia's nuclear saber rattling? Uh, thanks for the question. You know, I think specifics on. The statements of a head of state, I'll just leave to the State Department, of course. It's uh, you know not my lane. But what is in my lane is just the ability of our Air Force to adjust to those, those nuclear deterrence challenges, right? So as we talked about before, it's not as simple as saying that the Soviet Union might attack us at any moment and we have to be ready. There are a lot of subtleties and nuances. One of them is uh, nuclear threats. One of them is nuclear demonstrations. One of them is nuclear tests, one of them is low yield attacks, all those different things that might happen to us. Um, we have been constrained in our actions in the past 
based on a nuclear adversary. This actually isn't anything new. If you go back to the Korean War, if you go back to the Vietnam War, there are things that our joint force was not able to do because there were concerns about uh, nuclear adversaries. Uh, I would say just expand that as we have kind of that multipolar threat that you talked about uh, today. So is it concerning? Sure. Uh, is it something that we think about all the time on how to react to that? Absolutely it is. And I think it underscores the need for a full-scale modernization that gives us a variety of capabilities to offer to the to the president. Okay, well, thanks very much for that discussion. Um, we're now going to open the session to questions from the audience. Um, I think all of you know the drill by now. I'll call on you, and when I do, go ahead and unmute your mic, and please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. Um, you can also submit your questions using the Q&A function and I already have a couple of them up here. So let's start um, with Mr. Uh, Greg Hadley. Greg, go ahead. Awesome. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, Greg Hadley with Air and Space Forces Magazine. You mentioned uh, uh, a lot of work in the past couple of weeks on the ICBM modernization front. I was just wondering if you could specify with the program being restructured and, and going back before uh, Milestone B, what are the immediate next steps that need to happen? For, for Sentinel, for, as far as you're concerned, what what uh, work has to be done? Uh, thanks for the question, Greg. So I, I think there's two two facets to that. One is the work that needs to be done to ensure uh, Minuteman three sustainment is unbroken, and then the next steps are what has to happen with the with the program. What happens with the program is largely an acquisition lead, and so I don't want to get into a lot of details for that, but. Uh, work can still continue under the contract that exists today. Uh, so we don't want to slow down, come to a full stop on the program. Uh, but there does need to be a restructure to get after the cost growth that's happened. Uh, I was on the Hill uh, multiple days last week as part of our team uh, where Dr. LaPlante had described the challenges that we've had and described his uh, decision to certify. Uh, no one was happy with cost growth. And I think that Absolutely, in the Air Force, we're not happy with that either. So we do need to think about ways to get after that, but I don't think we should think of it as a full stop to the program until we can get to a new milestone B. So there will be continued steps taken. It is important to remember on the program that stage one, two, and three of the missile have been successfully test fired already. So uh, I'm not going to say that we've retired every risk on the missile, but largely the issues of the missile are known issues that can be worked and um, are largely okay. This is this is dealing with the gargantuan infrastructure challenges that we have. Uh, all the launch facilities, all the launch centers, all the wiring, all the that goes into that. That's the kind of work that will that we will roll up our sleeves and get back to and figure out the best program to provide to get to a milestone B decision in the future. Uh, and then I would say, just on the Minuteman side, I would just kind of refer you back to my previous comments where our Air Force is absolutely committed to making sure Minuteman is sustained. Uh, we, we have good funding for that now. We will continue and have pledged to continue with co uh, Congress. If, if unknown unknowns happen on Minuteman, we will get after that and make sure that that's covered until such time as Sentinel stands alert. Thanks, though. Thank you. A bit of a quick, a bit of a quick follow up uh, just on the basis of your this whole subject. Um, from an acquisition program uh, strategy perspective, uh, wouldn't it have been better to have divided up the infrastructure from the missile itself in the context of being able to explain to the Congress and the American public just what's going on? Because just as you said, the missile itself is doing pretty good. Um, it's mm -hmm. all these other parts and pieces that have been a big challenge. Thoughts on that? Um so to to go back and why would why did we make this decision years ago? You know, it's somewhat academic. Where we are, where we are today. True. Uh, I would say that there is, um, at at the time these decisions were being made, there was a broad understanding that the infrastructure uh, was coming to the end of life. And as you may recall, I talked about a little bit before. Minuteman three is really a, mi a missile that we put in an already existing infrastructure. So there was definitely a sense of we need to upgrade the entire thing and not just get a new missile in an, in an aging infrastructure. Now, to the issue of what is the best acquisition strategy of that going forward, I'm, I'm going to, you know, um, Mr. Hunter certainly didn't, uh, you know, leave it to me to make that decision. No, so I, I understand. I'll work just... that. Now, one, one thing I will add to that 
is as part of the restructures that we're going to have, we have brought a general officer in to take over that PEO management of ICBM. So we have, where we used to have a colonel doing Minuteman and a colonel doing uh, Sentinel, we now have a general officer that's going to be in charge of both. We have also added a general officer at Air Force Global Strike Command, and that's a, it's currently a one-star, but he just came out on the two-star list. So if confirmed, he'll get to the two-star level. Uh, so the idea would be you have both the operational commander has a two-star guy focusing on bed down in the program. You have a PEO that's a two-star. You have you know, kind of a three-star lead policy here. And then you have a three-star nuclear material manager at the Nuclear System Center. So I think that's a very broad growth in that oversight and leadership. And it, and really what that translates to is experience, right? It's not just about stars. It's about how much those acquisition leaders have experienced in the past. And so um, I, I have high confidence that they'll be able to get after and get-, get well, I agree with you a thousand percent, but you know, a lot of this stuff is about impressions. And it is Joe Q Public. Here's just you know a broad announcement in terms of cost growth. They think it's the missile, and it's not just the missile. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to Peter Wolf, the general. Why does everyone want a smaller yield B sixty one dash twelve? How is a smaller yield a deterrent to adversaries who adopt the opposite pick posture? Uh, okay, Peter. Thanks for the question. Uh, so, first of all. I don't know if I agree with you that our adversaries all have the opposite posture. I think there is a wide understanding that our adversary nations have a variety of yields, in many cases, low yield weapons um, uh, available to them. Now, some might call that tactical nuclear weapons. Some might call it non-treaty accountable nuclear weapons. May, some may call them non-strategic nuclear weapons, but there's, there's a variety of names for them, but it all comes down to a low yield capability. And, and I think it really comes down to we have to maximize the options to the president. If, God forbid, a nuclear attack happened, and it was not that proverbial thousand ICBMs going over the pole, but maybe it was a small attack in Europe or in the Pacific or in, in the Middle East, we don't want to tell the president our only option is a world-ending strike. We want to tell him that he has an option for a, a low yield, not to necessarily use it, but to provide that deterrent effect. And if the adversary understands that we have those options for the president, it is far more likely that they're not gonna take that action because the costs are gonna outweigh the benefits. Okay, here's one from Brian, Brian Everstein. Um, as part of the Nunn McCurdy review, there was a statement that Sentinel will face a delay of multiple years. Well, what will that mean for Minuteman Three? Are there additional life extension uh, steps required? Uh, thanks for the question. So I don't consider that what we're going to have to do to Minuteman to be a life extension. In other words, a SLEP. A SLEP was one of the one of the considerations Dr. LaPlante looked at to see if that, that made sense. And a long-term SLEP uh, still does not make sense for Minuteman. What is going to happen is Minuteman sustainment to keep it viable until Sentinel is, is delivered. And, and so again, I go back to we're funded on what we know about now. We're funded on what we can predict will happen. Uh, and then we, we have got commitment from the, both the Department of the Air Force level, Department of Defense level, and, and our assurances to the Congress that as those unknown unknowns develop, that those will be funded as well. Okay, here's an interesting one from Doug Smith. Arms control was used frequently throughout the Cold War to pump the brakes on nuclear proliferation. Today, China refuses to engage in nuclear arms control discussions with the United States, and the new START agreement with Russia is ending in 2026. Without formal arms control treaties, is there any hope left to prevent nuclear proliferation? Okay, and that was Doug Smith. Doug, yeah. thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, sure, there's absolutely a hope for, for future nu nuclear non-proliferation. I, I think it's important to remember, as we look through the history of arms control, uh, arms control often happened and treaties, some of the most important treaties happened at some of the hottest times of the Cold War. So we don't necessarily have to uh, like our adversaries to realize that it's in our interest and their interest to do arms control. Now, I think broadly to have successful arms control, you have to have three things. You have to have a shared sense, a shared understanding of what strategic stability looks like. In other words, they have to have an end state that is compatible with our end state. You have to have 
uh, transparency. In other words, we have to broadly know what their numbers are and, and in order to have a, honest talks about bringing down numbers. And then you have to have verifiability or else there, it's not useful to, to talk about it if we can't control that. If we don't have those three, then we're, we're broadly not going to get arms control. But we, we should always be working to those, to those options. Now, in terms of what does that mean for proliferation, you know, Kennedy once, President Kennedy said in the early 60s that he was haunted by a dark vision of a future with 10 or 15 or 20 nuclear powers. And he's often thought to have been wrong about that. Um, it, you know, what we, what we need to do is make sure that he was uh, not incorrect in his decision, just in his timing, right? We, we, we could see a world where several nuclear powers emerge if we are not uh, sharp on, on what we are doing. There's two aspects to proliferation. One is our adversary countries or countries we would uh, not ally ourselves with. And then there's the potential of proliferation from allied countries. Uh, we, we keep that from happening today through our deterrence, our extended deterrence initiatives. And we, we show our allies it's more in their benefit to maintain alliances with the United States than it is to have an independent nuclear force. Um, and then in terms of our adversary nations, we keep them from going nuclear because we convince them that the costs of going nuclear are going to be outweighed, or the benefits are going to be outweighed by the costs. Um, I think foundational to that is our nuclear modernization program. So if you're an allied nation and you see the nuclear deterrent atrophying, and then maybe we don't certify a leg of the triad or we do all those things, maybe you go down one course of action. But if you look and say uh, the Air Force is developing and delivering on LRSO, on B-21, the, the Navy's bringing Columbia online. We're bringing, the, you know, even, even with a tough cost situation, they're committed to certifying Sentinel and seeing that through. Then that, that will lead you to, there's no need to proliferate that, that the nuclear umbrella that the United States extended deterrent offers is, is sufficient. And so I, I think there's absolutely a path to keep proliferation from happening, which is in all of our interest. Um, and I would never give up on arms control. We have to have our eyes open about how likely it is in the current environment and what things need to change for that to happen. Um, we've got another raised hand with uh, Frank Wolf. So Frank, over to you. Yeah, um, hi, I'm General Frank Wolf at Defense Daily. Um, just on the, uh, excuse me, um, uh, Minuteman Three. Uh, when you said there, it's not a slip, but uh, again, this will be uh, uh, taking care of it until until we can get Sentinel out there. What, what do you, I just wanted to get any thoughts you might have on uh, sort of the the bottom line date at which Minuteman Three. You have to you have to have Sentinel out there. Is is there any date uh, of that of that short term modernization for for Minuteman Three? So I, I would say, Frank, you're coming in a little bit garbled. But what I heard you say is, what is the date at which Minuteman has to maintain in order to to implement Sentinel? Um, I don't think it's as simple as a date. There are different widgets and parts of the missile and different widgets and parts of the launch facilities and the launch control centers that age out at different times. Um, a, a full SLEP is not necessarily cost-effective with the operational capability we would need to have in the long-term future. And, and as, you, as you may know, certainly your readers may know, that we're talking about getting something out to the year 2075. And so SLEP just doesn't really make sense in that term. Uh, but in terms of keeping it alive, keeping it viable, keeping our deterrent posture strong until Sentinel arrives. It's gonna to have to be a couple of years longer than we would like it to be, uh, but that is something we're gonna absolutely have to, to do. Thanks for the question. And there's another raised hand. Let me switch to my good friend, uh, Bob Elder. Bob, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks, hey, General Rivera. Uh, appreciate the talk today. With with all the attention that uh, that we're getting on the uh, concerns with China and then secondarily Russia, and then we we could go on. Most of it's been focused on the conventional part of this, and uh, you, you read about uh, the Air Force looking at force design and everything I've seen talks quite a bit about the conventional part. It could just be that you can't talk about it, but could you tell us how the uh, nuclear uh, forces are being incorporated into the Air Force's force design? Okay, yeah, thanks Thanks for the question, Bob. So I, um, 
I don't know if I totally agree with you that that we haven't uh, put aspects of nuclear into our force design. It's possible that maybe they've been less public. Um, th th that's possible, of course. Uh, but I, but I think a lot of energy is going into force design with nuclear characteristics. So some of that is our nuclear programs. Some of that is, as we talked about with conventional nuclear integration, what aspects of education, knowledge base, et cetera, have to happen with uh, with the environment that we have today. Um, and then there's this question about what is the what does the future look like? So as you may recall, uh, last fall, the, the Congress had commissioned the Strategic Posture Commission, which was this bipartisan group of senior uh, respected officials to look at the, the nuclear uh, challenges that we, that we have. And they came out with a very long detailed report, a lot of, a lot of options, but their kind of their official kind of mantra has been that the, the nuclear posture that we have is necessary but insufficient, right? You, you may have heard about that. And uh, Bob, I know you have. Uh, I would say a lot of people focus on insufficient. I focus on necessary. So I am all for uh, adjustments to our force design and I'm all for future capabilities as long as they are uh, supportive of the the bedrock of our triad and of our, of our nuclear modernization force. And then after that, if we want to adjust, um, we if we see an opportunity to adjust the B-6113 or we see an opportunity to adjust in some other way, I'm absolutely supportive of all that. Uh, but the bedrock of it needs to be uh, the forces that we have today because we don't have unlimited time and resources to, um, these will eventually, eventually age out. Hope that helped. No, thanks. Appreciate it. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we've uh, come to the end of this Aerospace Nation. And uh, General Jabara, I really appreciate you taking the time to come over and uh, inform us of uh, everything that you've got going on in your plate. I think the audience is much more educated now after listening to what you had to say. Well, I appreciate the time. It's always fun, and uh, it's great to see you again. You bet. And to uh, all of you out there in the audience, from all of us at the Mitchell Institute, have a great air and space power kind of day.